my distinguished colleague, Professor G. L. Piris, Secretary, Ministry of Defense, Secretary, Foreign Affairs, all the service commanders, distinguished delegates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for me to be here to address the issue of the development of Sri Lanka and its implications for our region. May I begin by saying that this is a very important aspect which requires an organization like this, which requires a large gathering like this, to think, to contemplate, to think out of the box and share thoughts about what is obviously a very significant question, not only for us in Sri Lanka, but for the region. When we think of Sri Lanka and the region, the first thing that comes to mind is our geographical position. Both history and geography merge when we think of Sri Lanka because it is an island nation, midpoint between two of the most important and strategic areas of the globe. On one side we have the Middle East and on the other side we have the Far East. And we are right in the center of all the traffic that goes on between these two poles. It will surprise you to know that more than two-thirds of global shipping, including oil shipments, goes by the shores of Sri Lanka. It's no exaggeration. All the oil that goes to China, all the oil that goes to Japan, all the oil that goes to the other Far Eastern countries go by Sri Lanka. Then if you look at it from another aspect, we are only a few kilometers away from this great Indian subcontinent. With all the changes that are taking place, economic growth, demographic growth, new ideas coming out of our region. All this is only a few kilometers away from Sri Lanka. So if you look at all the island nations in this part of the world, firstly take Singapore, which faces a large landmass. Take Hong Kong, which faces the large land mass of China. If you take Dubai, which faces a large subcontinent that we call the Middle East, then we have to analyze Sri Lanka's hub position in terms of a country very, very strategically placed, I would say vitally strategically placed, having access to one of the largest populations in the world, markets in the world, and having a long history of basically good relations. So when we look at Sri Lanka as a hub, many things follow. We are ideally placed to be an aviation and shipping hub because we are simply midpoint in these big shipping and aviation lanes. We are also, 
we are a country having great potential as a service provider to the subcontinent. Don't forget that the fastest growing middle class in the world is just across our shores. The Indian middle class, the Bangladeshi middle class, the Chinese middle class. It's a large and changing face of the world's population which has tremendous implications in terms of service and other facilities that they will require. So one is a shipping and aviation hub, a second is a service providing hub, a third is a science and education hub. The region is fast adapting to new science and technology. Large numbers of people will be changing their lives because of changes in science and technology. And Sri Lanka is ideally suited, not only in terms of BPO-like connectivity, but frontier scientific activity. So we have the possibility of being a science and education hub. I don't go into the other possibilities, financial hubs, but let us look at Sri Lanka in terms of wide possibilities because of its geographical status. Now if we are to exploit that, if we are to get economic benefits from this situation, our location, at least three or four other factors must fit into place. The first is peace and stability. We cannot and we did not achieve our potential for 30 years because we were crippled by the lack of stability. We had in the heart of our country a terrible war a war against the LTT which has been recognized as the most dangerous, most murderous terrorist organization in the world. As has been so eloquently presented to you by my distinguished colleague, Professor Pires, there is no controversy, no doubt, no debate as to the viciousness and the terroristic ingenuity of the LTT. It only suffices to say that almost all the present terrorist devices which is bedeviling the world, even the most advanced countries, have originated in Sri Lanka. The idea of the human bomb, the idea of attacking political and other iconic personalities, the idea of attacks on armed services, attacks on aviation and shipping, unprovoked attacks on civilians. All these, if you analyze, you will find that they have their origins in that little part which was dominated by the LTT. It's a rare phenomenon when we read of terrorist activities in the United States, terrorist activities in the advanced countries, in the Middle East, you find most of that technology, most of the inventions have come from the LGT. And that is why I endorse what my distinguished colleague, Professor Peary, said, that had we not taken on and vanquished the LTT at that time, the face of terrorism, global terrorism, would be much, much worse and much, much more difficult to contain. So without boasting about it, without trying to make capital out of it, I think we can honestly say that not only the people of Sri Lanka, not only the people of the region, but the whole world 
should be grateful to Sri Lanka and the people who took on the LTG because if they were allowed to evolve more, if they were allowed more finance and more technology, space to work out their devilish schemes, I think not only us, but some of our own visitors may not have been able to make it to this meeting. So this is a matter which is not simply confined to the Sri Lanka army taking on a terrorist organization. It is a regional issue and a global issue. Now I'm happy to say Sri Lanka is one of the safest places in the world. You can walk anywhere, you can go day or night, you can take pub public transportation, you can take private transportation, you can go from the northernmost point to the southernmost point. It's no exaggeration. You can just step out now, get into a bus and go to any part of the country. So we have created a situation where from being one of the most dangerous spots on earth, we have in a short period of three years, little over three years, become one of the safest spots of earth. You look at our region, I don't want to mention countries by name, but we have all experienced countries which seemed relatively peaceful when we were fighting the war, are today very close to a state of siege. You can't get about. There are roadblocks everywhere. There's tremendous surveillance and intelligence activities going on. Paramilitary activities are going on in our region. So, in a sense, there has been a tremendous transformation, a change. A dangerous country has become a very safe place, and so-called safe countries have now become a dangerous place. That is the reality of the modern regional situation. Now we should look at it in another regional perspective. Today it is largely the safety of Sri Lanka that is guaranteeing the shipping lanes of the world. You know better than me as military people what has happened in Somalia, in the Horn of Africa, small piratical groups, terrorist groups can hold up the whole process of sea traffic. You have had to fight them, insurance people come into the act, freight people come into the act, shipping people, it becomes a huge global terrorist problem. And according to, there's a book called Monsoon, written by Robert Kaplan, who's a Harvard professor. He says that the sea lane from Middle East to Far East can be interdicted only at two points. It should not be that I should be talking to military people like this, but you know probably better than me, but let me refer to it. It can be interdicted one close to Sri Lanka and it can be interdicted in the Straits of Malacca. So that is the, those are the only two interdiction points and does not that create a great security interest in our region because the Indian Ocean today has become the focus of naval and military thinking. I don't think we can think so much of land wars. We have to think more of sea wars. From Sri Lanka right down to the South Pole, it's only the sea. It may be shocking. From Sri Lanka, from Hambantota to the sea, to the South Pole, there is no land mass. And today Indian Ocean is a highly, at least theoretically, contested area. Two of the world's largest emerging navies are the Indian and Chinese navies. They are of global status. The type of naval technology, the type of naval facilities 
that are gathering in the Indian Ocean. I think among the insiders, they know what the role of Sri Lanka and how important Sri Lanka is. Only a few months ago, you are bet better aware of this than me, the Americans have returned to Ghan Island. The British have moved over and they have established the outpost there. After so many years, why? Because the Indian Ocean, in my humble opinion, more than the landmass, it is the sea that will be a largely watched and contentious area in the future. So we are right in the thick of things there. Then if you look at the hub status, one is the peace and security of the country. That is very important. Without that, we can't think of really serious economic growth. Number two is investment in infrastructure, which can make use of that hub status. Various people question, why are you building a port? Why are you building an airport? Why are you building these roads? But they are all subsumed under this trust of trying to make the best advantage of our hub status. We cannot think of exploiting the fact that we are on the sea lanes unless we have new ports. And we are building a new port, one of the biggest ports in Hambantut. We are also building a big port. Here, if you step out, you can see the new port that is coming up. Someone might think that this is uh, exaggeration to say that this is all building big ports and talking about it. I just want to talk, read to you a little bit from the August, that's very recent, August issue of The Economist. And under the subject, why business is leaving India. Mr. Swami, I'm sure, has read this article. Dr. Swami, you've read that. It's a very interesting article. And in that, I'm, I must draw attention to the reference to the Colombo port. It's a very, very perceptive, uh, very per perceptive uh, piece. Just give me a minute to get to that. Here we are. This is what the, this is of course their version, I must say, this is a private uh, paper, they have their own views, it's not the views of any government, but this is what they say. Sri Lanka has tested relations with India, this is only a few, couple of issues ago, but Colombo is a vital port. About 30% of containers bound for India go via intermediate hubs fed by small vessels, either because big shipping lines do not want to deal with India's customs regime or because their ships are too big for the country's ports. About half of this transshipment business happens in Colombo. Its importance could increase now that a big extension to the port, that is what we are seeing across there, now that a new... Uh, that a big extension to this port there has just opened. The project was funded by a Chinese firm. That is not correct. Actually, it was funded by ADB. <laughs> Probably too polite to admit that its investment is partly based on the idea that India's ports will never be world class. I do, I'm, I'm only quoting the economist. <laughs> I don't want to go into the, the specifics or the allegations, but the general, the general feeling that we have something very valuable in this Colombo port, which can supplement. This takes a rather adversarial view of the Indian ports and Sri Lankan ports, but we need not go into that. We can complement our 
resources. And but thirdly, says that there is a great future for the port that we are, one of the biggest ports in Asia that we are just about to complete here in Colombo. So we have to build, the first is the peace and stability, second is infrastructure. This government has invested very, very largely in infrastructure, not in a haphazard way. Many people think that this is some haphazard investment in infrastructure. No. We have invested very, very heavily in North and East. And as my distinguished colleague said, this, merits, this gets only a throwaway line in Mrs. Pillay's report. Surely, I mean, this massive effort, catching up for 30 years in the North and East, deserves at least a paragraph. And these are facts, not allegations that we are authoritarian, etc. And so on. Those are matters of opinion. But what is happening in, in the North and East is a matter of fact. Any one of you here can go to the North and East of this country and see the amount of work that has gone on. Actually, if anybody complains, it should be people of the South, because there's so much of investment in the North. So much so that if you look at regional GDP growth, the Northern percentage of GDP growth is highest, higher than any other district or province in this country. So these are facts that have to be reckoned with. So, so we are investing in infrastructure. Now the third is macroeconomic policies. We can have peace and stability, we can have infrastructure, but we must also have macroeconomic stability in our economy. Now this is easier said than done because we are going through a very difficult time. Look at the Indian economy. Look at the economies in our region. They are all facing difficult times for a variety of reasons, but basically because those economies which are dependent on export income are finding that the markets are diminishing, particularly in the developed world, in the US and in the European Union. The demand is coming down. In my own view, even if there is going to be growth, we cannot recreate those great years of the last three decades. Because this Asian miracle which was based on low cost of production. The basic reason why China, India and Asia could capture the markets of the West was that the cost of production was way below what that unit would have cost in the developed world. We were willing to sell or we were able to sell at less than one third what it would have cost to produce it in the United States or in the European Union. And in the world of commerce, in the world of capitalism, that is the decisive factor. Now for 30 years we have had the benefit of it. China, India, they have had 10% growth, annual 10% growth for three decades or close on that. We ourselves have benefited soon after the war. 2010, we had 8.7% growth. 2011, we had 8% growth. Last year, when all the countries were reducing, bringing down their growth targets, we also brought it down, but by, but by very little, 6.7%. This year, we are hoping to get 6.5 to 7% growth. So, that growth was pushed or rode on the back of great demand in the developed countries. But with the economic crisis, that demand has come down. And not only that, it has become a tremendous political liability in the West, shutting down their factories, losing employment, that it has become today 
as we see in the European Union and in America, the very political fabric stability is threatened by this big gap between Asian goods which are flooding those markets and the inability of their domestic economy to create similar goods at those prices. So we are going to see an age of protectionism, whether we call it protectionism or not. Basically, it will be all types of little pinpricks or bigger legislation to prevent. Otherwise, they have no choice. Today, the theme is growth with employment. Earlier, they never spoke about it. The American president, the most desirable or most vulnerable depends on whether it is desirable or not, depends on the monthly employment statistics that reach the president. When employment statistics go up, he is happy. When it goes down, he gets into a panic. Because that has become very crucial. So how can they maintain that if our export economies are wiping them off the production map? That is the problem. Recently we know European Union put restrictions on solar panels made in China. That we you can't sell this in European Union. China responded by putting a ban on Italian wines. I think that's a matter of great concern for all of us in this hall. Immediately, European Union backtracked and said, we'll buy those solar panels. And China said, we'll buy the Italian wines. <laughs> so this is, that is what is going on. The whole uh, growth trajectory is being re-examined. And countries which depended on large exports have to think of domestic markets. Because those good times may not come back in the same way. We have to strategize and try to get back good times, but it may not come back in the same way. So, we have to look at our macroeconomic policies, which will take us in new and innovative directions. In Sri Lanka, we have emphasized food security. Earlier, we were advised, don't worry about food security. You collect money, if you have money, you can buy rice. That was the type of information that was given. Don't worry. Collect a surplus, you can buy money, your rice from anywhere. Today you can't do it. Now you can buy from Thailand. I think just now there is a glut of rice in Thailand because of other policy implications. But generally, today countries must first make sure that they can feed their people. Food security. I think Sri Lanka is an example to the world where our president and our government said, no, first let us make sure that we have sufficient quantities of rice, maize, vegetables, potatoes, onions, chilies, so that we have a solid base for economic growth that is beginning to pay dividends. Then we have the possibility in Sri Lanka of becoming a first-class service and science and technology hub. That is our future. We have a large market just across in India, in Pakistan, Bangladesh. So that is the, the future that is very much close to us. And for that we are changing our educational patterns, our welfare patterns, our other infrastructure commitments, so that all these things will or should come together. Now all this has regional implications because none of these things can happen unless we have regional peace, regional understanding and a projection of our services we can render to the region. I must say at present we have not fully explained 
how we are going to get about this and how we should work in that region. The whole region will benefit from our developing the shipping lanes. The whole region will benefit by our investment in infrastructure. The whole region will benefit by our investment in peace and stability. So we need to get together, we need to coordinate our resources because the next decade is going to be a tough decade. There are, I'm sure you will agree as a good economist, Dr. Swami, it's going to be a tough road ahead. People have to work hard, people have to strategize. There are no free lunches anymore. So in that light, I think we can make a very big contribution to the region. And this meeting, where all of us can put our heads together, discuss these things, is absolutely vital. And I want to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me and giving me the opportunity of saying these sometimes rather harsh words, but I know you will forgive me. Thank you.